everybody, welcome back to another video here on my channel. Today's topic, we're going to be talking about astrophotography filters for one-shot color cameras. Now, one-shot color cameras designates exactly what it means. So, when you take a single photo, you're going to have red, green, blue all together in one pixel count all the way across your, your image size. So whatever your, what they call the Bayer pattern is referring to, if you have one red, two green, one blue, that's your Bayer pattern of your four pixels. So for every photo, you're going to have 25% red, 25% blue, 50% green. So usually, whenever you take one-shot color photos, they usually turn out once you're done stacking them and uh, throw them into one of your processing softwares for the first time. They're going to be primarily pretty green, and that's due to why, because you technically have 50% pixels in your one-shot color camera are typically green. Now, different manufacturers, different chips, of course, come in different patterns. So some you might have two blues, you might have two reds, um, you might have just a standard RGB, one of each. So it just just depends on your uh, specific camera. But one of the things, particularly for light pollution astrophotography, using these one-shot color deep space cameras, is the use of filters. Filters are an amazing tool and they help us filter out the light pollution uh, that is surrounding everybody um, nearly in today's world. So how that happens is that we put a filter somewhere in the optical path between the telescope and the camera, and it will filter out those unwanted wavelengths of light. Now there's two different types. You're gonna have broadband and you're gonna have narrow band. Now broadband is kind of what it sounds like. It's a broader spectrum of the light uh, spectrum uh, wavelengths and what happens here is that a light pollution filter very similar to the astronomic CLS that I have here it I will show you the uh, chart pattern for what it filters out but this primarily will try to reduce sodium vapor uh, some of the newer ones uh, do LED filtering so that really helps in modern day world where a lot of the street lights are starting to convert to LEDs instead of the old style uh, halogen uh, sodium vapor lamps. They come in an inch and a half and two inch varieties. They come in little cases like this. They look just like this. And if you put this over the camera or something you can see kind of right there, it turns kind of a tealy blue color. And this isolates the background, gives you better contrast and it also helps you reduce the light pollution. Now, these type of filters are not going to be miracle workers. None of these filters really are. But these help you a lot on things like star clusters. You can try to use these on some of the brighter galaxies like the Whirlpool um, to try to get you know that light pollution neutralization and to try to get a little bit more clarity out of the background. It is kind of hard though, uh, I'm not gonna lie, it is kind of difficult even with one of these guys to get uh, really good data out of it if you have really severe light pollution. Light pollution is really the killer, unfortunately. So broadband is for primarily things that don't have a lot of gaseous content to them. Something like the Horsehead Nebula, which is almost primarily hydrogen alpha, hydrogen alpha, a little bit of oxygen, a little bit of hydrogen beta, those are the type of nebula that one of these is not going to do you much good. The only thing this will do you is you can take one of these, put it on that same field of the horse head, you'll probably get a glimpse of it, but you're more getting after the color of the stars surrounding it. Because sometimes with a narrowband filter, your stars can get a little wonky in their color because you're filtering out all those different wavelengths of light that the only color that's coming through is primarily reds, pinks, oranges from those uh, spectrums of light that we're going to be talking about here in just a second. So broadband can help correct your star colors, but primarily these are used for targets that are just open clusters, some brighter things like galaxies that don't really contain a lot of the gaseous uh, content to them. On the other hand of the spectrum, we have narrowband. Now this is a IDAS NBZ filter, Nebula Booster, 
And this one is the ultra high speed version. So this is for my F2 Hyperstar imaging rig. They do make a standard version, which is good basically from F4 uh, onwards down. So they do have two versions. A lot of these newer filters will come in the two variants between a regular and an ultra high speed. Basically the difference is once you use narrow band filters on something like an F2 imaging system like the Hyperstar, Arasa, something like that, the bandwidth of the transmission generally shift a little bit and that depending on which way it's shifting, could affect the image result that you get. Because if you are trying to shoot something and let's say the, you know, the narrowband uh, transmission of hydrogen alpha is, you know, this specific wavelength and it shifts a whole percent or so, it's going to be a big difference because you may not get as much data or pull as much nebulosity out of that target as you thought you could. So, it's good to invest in one of the ultra high speed versions if your telescope is one of those telescopes that require this. Now one of these guys also comes in an inch and a half and a two inch just like the broadband. And this one turns targets a little bit more of a deeper color. So this one is a deep teal, uh, almost a dark blue color. And this one though is primarily, this specific NBZ, is primarily for hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, and oxygen. So you do not get any sulfur transmission with one of these. The hydrogen beta is almost non-existent in one of these filters. So it's primarily gonna be focusing on hydrogen alpha and oxygen with one of these. Now the NBZ, the reason why a lot of people like this one specifically for one shot color, is this one isolates the light pollution down so far and the transmission of this is very, very thin. So they are very specific wavelengths of hydrogen alpha and oxygen that this wants to see. If anything is broader than that, unfortunately this is going to pretty much block it out. However, that means that using one of these guys, you can image on a full moon. You can usually image and really heavy light pollution and you can pull out the horse head or something like that with just a single exposure with 30 seconds and you'll see the outline of the horse head with one of these because this is what they're designed to do they're designed to pull out uh, that faint nebulosity in a light polluted background but also block all that light pollution so it comes through the third type that I have in my case and what I kind of, I call this kind of a little bit of a hybrid narrowband filter because this one, even though it's still narrowband, it's still primarily oxygen, hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, some of them touch sulfur a little bit. If you get like the uh, triad filter from OPT, they have uh, one that covers all four of the major gas spectrums. And those though are crazy expensive. They're like a thousand bucks a piece for one of these two inch formats. They're very, very, very expensive. And honestly, not a ton of objects that you're gonna be imaging or at least learning how to image on are going to have the sulfur. So basically one of these filters here, this is the L Enhance filter filter from Optolon. This one has a little bit wider of a hydrogen alpha, a little bit wider of an oxygen, and this one also allows hydrogen beta to come through as well. So you get three out of the four with one of these guys. They do make an L Extreme, which is a little bit closer to one of these guys. They also have a brand new one that just came out uh, that's even closer to the, the IDAS one. But the L Enhance though, has been one of my favorites though from the front yard with my F5 Common Hunter because with stacking a bunch of hours worth of images, this will pull off quite nicely a lot of detail and nebulosity in some of those fainter targets. This will easily capture the structure in the Pac-Man. This will easily capture you the horse head with no problem. Just give it, like I said, a couple hours of stacking and you'll have an absolutely gorgeous photo of the horse head. You can put one of these on the Orion Nebula and get really faint dust throughout the field. So these filters are really, really good. Now I've used one of these on my F2 system and it's actually quite decent. It doesn't advertise what it's utilized for in terms of the transmission and what F numbers that they recommend. Typically they'll tell you this is suited for a telescope that's, you know, F1.5 to F4. This is what the ultra high speed versions usually are. And then one of these guys are usually okay for anything slower than F4. So F4 all the way down to, you know, 
F10, F15, whatever you want to be imaging at, these are usually pretty good at. So this one though isn't really specified. However, this one I have had lots of good success with. The thing you have to look at is these filters are quite expensive. They're usually a couple hundred dollars a piece. That IDAS filter is about $325. And some of them, like the Triad filter, can get up to a thousand. Now, the thing is you have to take into consideration is how much are you going to be using these filters? Let's say you're only at a Bortle 2 or a Bortle 4, you may not be using these as much as somebody like myself who's at a Bortle 8. So there's a big difference there between the two. The other thing you have to think about is what are your type of targets that you want to be shooting? Because if you're just looking for something like the horse head, you're looking for some of the brighter stuff, you're going to try the rosette, you're going to try, you know, Thor's helmet, some of the stuff that's more heavy in oxygen and hydrogen, one of these two are absolutely fine versus something as expensive as the triad filter. So basically you just take that one shot color camera, thread it on the front or somewhere in your optical train. On the Rasa it was the front adapter, on the Hyperstar there's a filter drawer slider. So there's all different ways. In my Comet Hunter you just thread the filter directly onto the barrel, the two inch barrel that the camera goes into. So there's all types of different ways to mount these filters but they really do amazing work. And when I first started out, it was very confusing trying to figure out which one I needed, why do I need this, why do I, why do I need that one, not this one. And you have to basically look and see just what types of targets you're gonna be looking at. What type of tar targets do you wanna be learning how to take pictures of? Because those are going to tell you which one of these you need. Would I recommend something as specialized as the Nebula Booster? Absolutely, if you're just using it for hydrogen and oxygen based targets, like the Pac-Man, like the Rosette, Crab Nebula, things like that, absolutely, it's going to give you the maximum light pollution suppressant and then the maximum light or uh, nebulosity transmission in those wavelengths to your camera lens, so, or to your camera chip, and that is what's most important when shooting one of these targets. Broadband, it's always nice to have a broadband and you don't have to go all crazy and get one that's, you know, three, four hundred dollars. You can get a broadband as simple as the Orion Sky Glow imaging filter that is a decent light pollution suppressant filter. That one starts at about hundred and fifty dollars for a two inch format. It's not terribly expensive, but it still does the job good enough that it'll get you by and it'll do whatever you need it to do. But most of the time I find myself shooting targets with those narrowband imaging filters more than the broadband because there's a lot more potential with the higher transmission of the nebulosity and the much higher cut of the light pollution. Where the broadband, they still let in a little bit of light pollution because if you chop away too much of the light spectrum, you're going to basically, you know, ruin the aspect of a broadband filter, which is to still allow visible light in, in all different color spectrums. So it's a little bit of a catch-22 with the broadbands versus the narrowbands, but it's always good to have one and the other, and then you can swap between them for one-shot color cameras. Now, when you're typically doing a one-shot color camera, you would take all of your targets and you'll throw them into serial, Pixinsight, Astro Pixel Processor, Star Tools, whichever uh, software you want to use. And you can, in Cyril, I know, a way, uh, just that's the way I've learned so far, you can slice and dice the channels to make a RGB view and create different versions of SHO, you know, other, uh, you know, palettes that are typically found in monochrome cameras. Now, the big thing is, do you want to go mono or do you want to stay with one shot color? And that's honestly up to you. Basically, the difference though is one shot color, one of these filters is going to capture all of your light at one time for you. You just may have to do a lot longer of exposures in terms of the length of time. So you may have to do, you know, eight hours instead of four hours. Whereas monochrome, if you know what your target is, you can just put in the filter that just targets that exact wavelength of light. And you can capture a lot more because with a monochrome camera, your Bayer matrix that we talked about at the beginning of the video is just all whatever you choose it to be. So if let's say this was a red filter and I put this in front of my camera, all of my pixels are gonna be red, 
100% red, and then this one's 100% green, and then 100% blue, and you know, and then you can get the specialized filters where you can get one that's oxygen, one that's uh, hydrogen, the next one that's sulfur, etc. And then your pictures will be 100% oxygen, 100% sulfur, 100% you know hydrogen, and you'll stack those individually. A one-shot color, you stack them basically the same way except all of them are going to merge together at one time and create the final result and you can slice and dice those though you can separate them in something like photoshop or affinity or serial can output them in different channels you can uh even output them in serial into different channels and then edit them based per channel and then stack the photo together using like an hdr method uh there's there's just a hundred different ways you can process one-shot color and monochrome images, but you just have to see which way fits you. But I've chosen the one-shot color route in terms of it's a lot easier to learn, it's a lot easier just to set up and tear down each night. Um, but I know a lot of people that ha do mono and they absolutely love it and they get absolutely astonishing images. And while I'm still learning how to get images like that, there are people though with one-shot color cameras that get photos that rival those ones of the monochrome cameras. So cameras nowadays are just so much different than they were 10 years ago. The one-shot color cameras have come a really long way and they're really impressive versus what they used to be. So they're, they're approaching on to monochrome imaging, especially with these type of filters that just leap one-shot color cameras very close in range with mono because this allows those very faint light paths to come through to your camera sensor lens. As always, thank you for joining. I hope that you enjoyed this video and the more content to come. Stay tuned. Clear skies to you all.